like I promised, coding time. I want to show you how to write a basic ray tracer that shoots a primary ray, shadow ray, and does some simple glossy reflections uh, inside Falcor. Uh, anyone wants to guess how many lines of code it's going to take us? Ballpark? Hundreds? Thousands? Okay. Uh, the only thing you need to know about DXR, I want to show the API, but the only thing you, know, you need to know about the DXR is the ray tracing pipeline. It's going to start with the ray generation shader. Uh, then we're going to do the traversal, intersection tests, and at the end, if there was a hit, the closest hit shader is going to get called, and if not, we're going to get a miss shader. Uh, literally, that's the only thing you need to know about the, how DXR works. You don't need to know anything else about it. So uh, this is our own load code. Um, the first part um, basically creates our miss programs and our heat programs. You can see there are two types of shaders. Um, we create a primary miss and a shadow miss, and the same for the closest heat shaders, um, and a single ray generation shader. Uh, we use those programs to uh, create something called ray trace program. Uh, and from that, um, RT program bars. Basically, this is our data structures where we're going to bind all our materials and all our shader constants. Uh, this thing, for those of you who know DXR, these seven lines of code are, is, is the part that's going to basically create a uh, um, very large part of the ray tracing pipeline state object. Uh, the next part is creating loading a scene. Uh, behind that single load from file call, we're going to create the acceleration structure. There's like, I think, two or 300 lines of code there. Uh, and the scene renderer, which is just a helper class that's going to help us bind materials into the shader binding table uh, and dispatch the ray tracing call. Uh, finally, we need to create our ray tracing pipeline states um, and set the program into it. The MAC trace recursion depths basically say we're going to have uh, two trace ray calls inside our shaders, one from the ray generation program and one from our closest hit. The last line um, just creates our output texture. Um, this is everything we need to do in all and loan. This is going to create our shader binding tables, our resources, um, our acceleration structures. It's going to compile all the shaders. Um, this is our own frame render. First thing we want to do, we want to update our scene in case we have dynamic object there. It's going to uh, move the camera, animate uh, any uh, skinned objects we have in the scene. Uh, this part just sets, like I said, it's, uh, um, this. Um, our ray trace varbs is uh, the way how we bind um, variables into the shader. So basically, we bind some uh, variables into the constant buffer. And you can see the code is very clear. You can you you know what it means because you can tell that we gonna uh, bind an inverse view matrix into the constant buffer. Set the texture as the output and render scene. And this is again gonna go and it's gonna bind all the textures and all the materials and. Um, update the shader binding table in an optimized way, um, and then call uh, ray trace. And finally, we're going to blit it. That's everything we need to do in the C++ code. Um, <clears throat> the last thing I want to show you is the primary ray CHS. For those of you who know ray tracing, uh, I'm skipping the ray generation shader because it's pretty simple. Um, I want to focus here on two things, because the first part is uh, um, uh, Roy JLSL code, so I'm going to skip it a little. I want to get to that part, which is get vertex attribute and prepare shading data. This is the part that uh, is going to invoke our material system. Um, basically, get vertex attributes is going to go in and um, fetch the current triangle data, current um, pixel data, uh, using the barrett centric coordinates, and prepare the shading data is going to go and fetch all the data we need from the textures and the current material. Uh, and then evil material, this is our physically based material system. This is where we're going to go. We're going to evaluate GGX. We're going to uh, run the Disney uh, diffuse BRDF. Um, I'm going to give you a final result. Um, very fake roughness, uh, a very fake way to do a, a reflection just because I didn't want to go into the hassle of running GGX here. Um, and that's it. We're going to get that image. Um, so the nice thing about that sample which we're going to release is that because it's Falcor and because Falcor support board tracing, ray tracing, and rasterization, with three lines of code, I can actually switch between uh, the ray tracer and rasterizer-based renderer. 
uh, with shaders. Um, it's the same sample, you hit spacebar, and l literally it's three lines of code. You need to create a different scene renderer for the rasterization. Instead of RT scene renderer, just call a regular scene renderer, and that's it. And this allows us to switch back and forth. You know, when we test our path tracing techniques and when we test ray tracing techniques, we can switch back and forth between ray tracing and rasterization. All right, so we're going to, I'm going to show a little demo we've built. Uh, Amida Research built on top of Nier's, um, you know, Falcor rendering library. So we built a, a kind of a lightweight render path solution where different, different researchers, we're about 10 people working on the same code base, implement render passes in the same, same framework. Those render passes hooked together, uh, each one generates you know, inputs and outputs. Here it's running, on a, it's running on a single GPU. There are multiple GPUs in the machine, but we don't, we don't have multi-GPU support yet. This demo is shooting, first of all, it's shooting one ray for diffuse lighting at the hit point at the, per pixel, then it's shooting one reflection ray per pixel, and then at the, at the hit points of the reflection rays, it's shooting three additional rays. So we're doing five rays per pixel, um, and then there's denoising filters applied. So it's running, yeah, I think it's running around 25, 25, 30 frames per second in this case. It's fairly, a lot of things left to optimize, of course, but um, it shows that we can build, we can build something pretty complicated on top of Falcor by reusing a lot of the, you know, the boilerplate code and abstractions. So this is, you know, this lets us focus on the algorithmic development and not, not the thousands of lines of code to actually get something running with DX12 and, and DXR. This is a list of stuff we have currently have in our effects library. Uh, we're going to keep pushing the boundaries of what the visual quality inside the frameworks mean. Um, like I said, 70% is a target, is a moving target. Uh, game engines keep getting better, and we have to keep up. So we're going to keep adding things to Falcor. Um, one last thing, we also have something called the Open Research Content Har Archive because having good material system is worth nothing unless you can get good assets and we're lucky enough to work with some partners to uh, who provided open source assets. So Amazon donated the Bistro. Uh, we got some good uh, trees from Speedtree. Uh, Nick, our own artist, created this Emerald Square um, and Epic uh, donated the Sun Temple. So you can go to, um, you can go to um, developer.nvidia.com.orca and get those assets and please stop using Sponza. Please. Um, you can get Falcor from GitHub and the last link for our developer blogs, you can get some more information about DXR and RTX. Uh, there's a good blog by Martin Stitch there, so I encourage you to go and read it. <laughs>